Well, good Sunday morning to everybody. Welcome to church today. Um, I'd like to start our service just with a just with a survey question. I heard this on the radio. Maybe you did as well. I think it was two days ago. Maybe it was yesterday. And it was talking about happy kids, happy children. And it said there's one type of pet. They did all this research. I don't know who did this, but there's one pet that was tied to the happiness of children, whatever that means. But And what do you think that pet was, the type of pet that your child could have and take care of? A dog, right? Dogs love everybody. They just want, they just love everybody. It's not a dog. A, I thought goldfish. They, they just look at you and they're happy. It's not a goldfish. Definitely not a cat. They have attitude problems. The world revolves around them. What do you think? Not a, not a rabbit, not a hamster, not a snake. It was, get this kids, ready? You can go to Petco today. It was a rat. Eli, got, it's, it was a rat. They said rats are very intelligent and they're easy to care for. And I, I don't know, it was a quick radio thing so they didn't go into detail. So the host on the radio, it was on Family Life, I think it was Therese Me. She said, well, we're not getting a rat and I am perfectly content with unhappy children. <laughs> so don't go to Petco today, don't get any rats. But um, seriously, at the start of service, I, I wanted to share something I found yesterday. Um, I don't know how I came across this, but um, I'm not going to tell you who this quote is from. I'll tell you at the end, um, just some quotes. And this person said, now at 66 years old, getting ready to turn 67, having just buried my mother, I made a promise to her and to God, not just to do good the right way, but to honor my mother and my father by the way I live my life the rest of my days on this earth. I'm here to serve, to help, and to provide. Um, let me scroll down just a little bit. He says, in every prayer in recent times, all I hear God saying to me, the response is, feed my sheep. That's what God wants me to do. He says, but what does that mean? And he said, what I found out in the last couple of years is there's all kinds of sheep. So that's why I talk to experienced shepherds and pastors to help guide me. He said, the world has changed around us. And he says, the Bible tells us in the last days we'll become lovers of ourselves. The number one photograph in the world right now is what kind? Selfie. Selfie. He goes, so we all want to lead. We're willing to do anything, ladies and young men, to be influential. He said, fame is a monster, and we all have these ladders and these battles that we have to climb and fight, roads we have to walk in our given lives. And he talks about fame a little bit. It is a famous person, but he says, stay on your knees. He said, you can watch me, but listen to God. He said, I hope that the words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart are pleasing in God's sight, but I'm just human. I'm just like you. What I have will not keep me on this earth for one more day. So share what you know. Inspire who you can. Seek advice when you need it. If you need to talk to someone, talk to the one that can do something about it and constantly develop these habits. And then his last quote said, um, his longtime pastor told him, he said, fear is nothing but contaminated faith. And that's what he closed with. Now, it is a very famous person. Who do you think this might be? It's a famous actor, currently still alive. It's Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington. Now, you may not agree with movies he's been in. You may not watch those. You may not agree with a lot of what Hollywood stands for. And he talks about that in this article. He said, those are roles I play. Those aren't who I am. Um, but an extremely talented man and someone I did know something about his background. Um, his father was a Pentecostal minister, um, and he has really experienced a change in his heart in the last um, couple decades. Been married for 40 years this year uh, to his wife. So just an inspiring quote. Is he perfect? Absolutely not. No one is. Um, but just to hear those words, he was speaking at a men's, um, for young men, uh, a men's conference uh, with those quotes, and that made it into the news. Um, which was pretty cool, pretty cool to hear. So again, welcome. Hope that, that just that is inspiring to you, uh, the embedded um, scripture he was quoting in, in the lessons. You know, who do we talk to? We can talk to God. Um, and I really like that last part. Fear is just contaminated faith. We have to get that, take care of that um, contamination, get that fear out of there. So welcome, everyone who's here, everyone joining us. Um, if there's any visitors or even visitors joining us for the first time online, you can contact the church. Uh, using email if you have any questions or if you're here in person, 
we can get a contact card filled out for you and we can we can reach out and stay in touch with you so let's open in prayer and then we will sing uh, hymn number 31 so let's pray heavenly father we thank you um, just for your truth today that we can look to your word look to you you're the one we can talk to and lean on and depend on uh, that we can look around and we can hear and see examples God, you call us, you call us as believers. If we know your son, Jesus Christ, is our Savior, we're called to service. Faith, yes, but also to put that faith into action, whatever that means. God, that you have, again, tasks and you have opportunities for each of us individually, uh, corporately here as our church body and, and worldwide as, as the greater church. Uh, what that means to serve, what that means to, to help, what that means to teach, uh, to inspire. Uh, to love and to lead others to you. I thank you, God, that we can have this local church just here in Elba, that we can have a presence outside of this, this town and this county and this state. We can um, harness technology that you've provided, God, to spread your message and your word. And I pray this morning, God, that you would uh, affect change in our hearts. Thank you for the message that um, you have given to us today, that, that you've given Pastor Michael to prepare um, talking about in the book of Revelation the churches and the examples of those churches and where do we identify? Um, which one of those churches might, might we be? What are the things that we have to uh, confront and deal with to develop that first love again? Uh, thank you for today for all the ways that we can praise and worship you for your just unimaginable goodness to us and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll take a hymnal close by you there. We'll turn to page 31, and we're going to sing a great Charles Wesley hymn, Love Divine. Let's stand and sing. Then at this time, uh, we're going to ask Rachel Barton to come, our second of our two new ministry interns that we're so excited to have here uh, working with our teens and our youth. So Rachel's going to come and share.
Well, good morning. Um, one second, I forgot something. So, um, I'm really thankful for this opportunity to um, get to be up here and to share a little bit about myself and about how I came to know the Lord and everything that he's done in my life um, since then. Um, so, I was born into a Christian home um, about 30 minutes outside of Schenectady, um, Albany, New York, in Schenectady. Um, I am the second oldest of four kids, so that is three girls and a boy. Um, my mom homeschooled all four of us all the way through. Um, and I'm really, really thankful also to be, um, to have been raised by Christian parents who love the Lord and who taught me and my siblings to know him. So all growing up, we were really, really involved in our local church. Um, we were there for every Sunday service, every kids event, every Bible study, like any excuse to be in church, we were there. Um, and so church was something that was really normal to me. Um, and I was always surrounded by Bible teaching. So because of that, um, when I was around eight years old, I remember understanding the gospel for the first time. Um, and it was at that point that I, I accepted Christ as my savior. Um, but like I said, church was something that was really, really normal to me, almost too normal to the point where I kind of stopped listening to what was being taught um, and it just became like something that you just kind of do and I started going through the motions. Um, and so at that point, I knew that I was saved from my sin, but I figured like if I just continued going to church and upholding um, a good reputation, that that was kind of it and I could set it at that. Um, so because of that, I grew really sort of apathetic to the idea of having my own faith. And as I started growing, um, kind of gaining my own personality, sort of, I um, grew, started to grow further and further from the Lord because I started to develop this attitude of self-sufficiency that was really just deeply rooted in pride. So as I grew up into middle school and high school, went through that teenage phase um, of just being really self-centered, um, and I just began to build my life on um, the opinions of the people around me, what I looked like, um, and I just really was striving for um, acceptance from the people around me. Um, I was just really selfish. I just kind of had this idea that like, um, if, if I don't just take care of myself, that nobody would really take care of me. So it's up to me um, to make sure that you know I'm good enough. And so that's all I cared about. Um, I just began to be really, like I said, selfish. All I cared about was myself. I didn't really care how I treated other people. Um, this really started to hurt my relationship with my family, my parents especially. Um, I didn't really have a lot of good friends. Um, I ended up in middle school making friends that were really not good influences on me at all. Um, and then that just kind of built and built and built um, up until I got to my junior year of high school when it really all culminated, and I had developed really, really severe depression and anxiety as a result of my lifestyle and the way that I was living. Um, and I was just miserable. I was, I felt like I was an empty shell of myself. I was living for all the wrong things, um, and it just was not satisfying me, and I just felt so empty and so broken all the time. And so um, when I got into high school, I started having just like, really, really terrible anxiety, like I said. And um, I started to have panic attacks on a regular basis. And so it all reached a point where um, it was around the beginning of my junior year of high school. I was having a really, really rough day. I was home alone in my room in the dark and I was just really suffering and really struggling a lot. And I remember at a moment that I see now as true rock bottom for me, I just cried out to the Lord saying, God, where are you? Where have you been this whole time? And in that moment, I really felt what I can only describe as the most loving conviction where the Lord really just started to, um, to reveal to me my sin. And the way that I had been living 
that was not pleasing to him and just every single thing that I had put my faith in and my trust in that was not him. And he just started showing me all of the ways that all of those things just failed me over and over and over. And I really felt the Lord telling me like, Rachel, I've been here the whole time. And you are the one who's been forsaking me, but I've never forsaken you. And so that was the point when I rededicated my life to Christ. I repented from that sin. And ever since then, it's been a slow build back up of me learning who I really am in Christ and finding my confidence in that, finding my worth in that, um, and not only trusting Christ for the salvation from my sin, but also learning to live my life for him because he loved me enough to save me to have a relationship with him. So um, after that, I decided to go to the Word of Life Bible Institute um, to get a really strong biblical foundation. Because like I said, I'd been in church all my life, but I, didn't, I really didn't know much about the Bible at all. And so I wanted to learn. I wanted to get to know my Savior. So um, I spent two years at the Bible Institute. That's where I met David. Um, and yeah, ever since then, uh, I've just been learning more and more about who God created me to be and how um, if I put my hope in the world, I will be failed every single time. But God, the God of the universe, the God who loved me enough to send his son to live a perfect life and to die for my sin and to be raised again so that I can live forever with him, um, not only to be saved and go to heaven, but also to know him and to live for him in my life on earth. So I want to finish by reading um, a portion of scripture that really speaks to this time in my life. Um, and um, it just really, really helped me a lot um, through this time. So it is Jeremiah 17, um, 7 through... Sorry, five through eight. So it says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For it, its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing. Um, and if you didn't know, David and Rachel are engaged recently. Um, and when she said she was at Word of Life, and that's where she met David, I did not hear David say amen. Or thank you, Lord. <laughs> just kidding, David. Just kidding. Just teasing you. Um, but right now, we'll just enter into a quiet time of prayer. Really, maybe, again, like last week, when David shared, think about what Rachel shared. Uh, if you put your trust in the world, um, we will be failed every time. I will be failed. Um, it's not I will fail. Um, but the world can't provide um, what God can. So let's, uh, let's pray.
morning, everyone. We're excited to worship with you today. Um, we have a new song that we'll do second. It's called Promises, and um, it really ties in well to Rachel's testimony. Um, there's a part in the song that talks about where we're going to put our trust. It says, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus. He's our anchor to the ground. Um, and I just love that part. And so it really ties in nicely with what you shared. And thank you. That was definitely a blessing to us. And um, would you stand and worship with us this morning? Some people think you're distant, just some words on the page. And you're nothing more than fables handed down along the way. But I've seen you part the waters where no one else could pull me from. It's who you are.
This new song, Great is Your Faithfulness to Me. Just let that be something we can sing right now, continue to sing in our hearts and throughout today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You be seated. Well, good morning again to everybody. I uh, hope you're having a good week. Uh, a lot of things going on. and uh, Glad to see everybody here in person. And if you're online with us, then uh, we're glad you're here as well. My name is Michael. I'm the pastor here. Uh, and so today, uh, we are in our series, and we're in the book of Revelation, so go ahead and turn there. Uh, we'll be in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, and today we get into the churches, so if you've been waiting uh, for that moment that we start talking about the churches, then here it is. Uh, for some of us, we go, oh, I read some of that stuff about the churches, and oh man, I, I feel convicted at times. Is, is that where we're at? Is this where we're at? Are we doing these things well? Are we not doing others well? Well... I hope that as we go through this, uh, we'll have a good picture of that. We'll be able to kind of see some things clearly as Jesus lays out for the churches uh, where they're at. Okay? And today we're looking at the uh, church in Ephesus. Church in Ephesus, one of the more well-known churches in Asia Minor. Um, Paul devoted a, a whole book of the New Testament to Ephesus. And so we know a little bit more about Ephesus than other places. The phrase that I want you to remember is just this, a first love. A first love. And so... When we think about a first love, uh, many of us go back to the time when we uh, saw our spouse for the first time. Uh, I know when I saw Christy for the first time, uh, it was, you know, very uh, movie-esque. The, uh, it seemed like time slowed down and like music was playing as her hair was waving in the wind. Uh, although she was, yeah, yeah, she's not going to talk about her. So, uh, yeah, but she, but she was walking into a classroom, so I don't know how that works, but that's just, you know, it's just what happened for me. Uh, and so I, I think back to that and all the things that progressed because of that in a, a first love that I had that turned into, well, real love. And you know, as you, as you see somebody for the first time, there's that initial infatuation. You think, man, that person is awesome. Like, I'm going to love them so much. And you will, and you'll try. And things will be difficult at times, right? And at times, I feel like, too, we, we get away from that first love, that first feeling in that first picture um, that we experienced when we first met that other person. And so today, I hope that we kind of think about that a little bit, because as Jesus unpacks for the church where they're at, um, we should think about the loves that we have in our life, our spouse, our children, our family, because Jesus is going to relate directly to that. He's going to help us understand that in some of these relationships, we get a better picture of how we have loved God, and at times we've maybe stepped away from Him, Okay. And so, just to remind us, the vision statement for the church, we talked about this last week, but our vision is we want to be about loving Christ, growing the church, and reaching the community. And I hope that every aspect of our ministry in our church and everything that we say uh, reflects that. And if it doesn't, then let me know, uh, because that's what we want to measure ourselves to. And so, I hope you're already in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, and we're about to dive into it. I want to give you a little bit of background, and I'll do this every week. Um, John, who is on the island of Patmos, is... Uh, writing this letter. He's writing directly what he's seeing. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen this um, uh, this introduction to an evaluation of the churches, and, and we also look at the vision for this evaluation of the churches that is leading into what Jesus is going to tell us today in Revelation chapter 2. And, and John's on this island, not like an island like you would think of, like in the Bahamas. It was not a fun place. Uh, it was a place where uh, the government sent people to die. Uh, other criminals would be put there. Uh, it was a very desolate place. There wouldn't have been much to eat, um, and people would have been kind of at each other to get what they could. So, again, think more Hunger Games than Bahamas or where uh, John was at. So he's writing this letter, and, and Jesus is he's really opening up space and time, and he's bringing him into a place that, that really nobody else has seen in all of history. And can you imagine uh, John, who was uh, with Jesus during his ministry, um, he, he, he watched as he was crucified. He took his 
mother under his wing and took care of her after Jesus he raised from the dead and then went on into heaven. And Jesus is like, hey, here's my mother. Here's, she's your mother too. And so John was not just anybody, right? Um, he could have, from the start of this book, gone, hey, guys, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I don't know if you know me, but there's been some important things that I've done. And now I'm going to talk to you about the end. Uh, no, he, we remember reading at the very beginning, he says, your brother. Um, so John doesn't count himself as anything more than what he is, just a follower of Christ and a uh, brother to the church, okay? So we think about that as we read this. And so as John's writing, as he's seeing these things, and Jesus is giving him these words about the church in Ephesus, um, we're going to see a few things. But just remember, um, in Ephesus as well, this was a place that was pretty difficult, really hard ground. There were a lot of things that were going on. They were in complete opposition to God. So think about that, the secular culture. Uh, but then at the same time, there were also groups of people who were claiming to be believers. They were claiming to be Christians, but they really weren't. And so they were distorting stuff. And, and so Ephesus had to deal with a lot of different issues, right? People blatantly against God and the people who said they were for God, and they really weren't. And so uh, let's be thinking about that as we read this, because we hear about a first love and we think, oh man, you know, I know Jesus and I will never fall away from him. I will never struggle. Well, you know, that's true for all of us, right? We struggle, we fall short all the time, we have difficult seasons, right? As Rachel shared, difficult seasons. And then we come to a point where we realize, man, I need to get back to that place where I first came to know Jesus. And for some of us, it was like I was a little kid, right? And so you came to know Jesus, and you're like so excited in his life, and as things go on and things get difficult, you're like, I don't know, it seems really tough. Well, Jesus is going to give us some encouragement. And right off the bat, he says here, uh, in the first fill in the blanks, just going to be the good. Okay? So fill in the blanks are going to be easy today. The good. Uh, and so in verse 1, uh, we see a good God. And we have to know God in order to love him, right? We can't just, but we can't just know about him, right? We know a lot of people that know about God. And so we'll see in verse 1, it's going to tell us, hey, how do we really, how do we really know God? It says here in verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands so we saw this great picture of who jesus is uh last we're looking at this vision of like uh john he's he's looking into heaven and eternity and he's seeing all these amazing things about god and who he is and then here in verse one he, he reminds him and, and here's what he says the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the golden lampstands remember those golden lampstands the churches so he's He's in in the midst of them. He's holding these seven stars who are the uh, pastors of the churches. So he's he's leading. He's trying to guide and direct them. Uh, who will guide and direct the churches, which are the lampstands. And sometimes I feel like we kind of get a strange picture of Jesus at times, right? We don't really see him for who he is. And in verse 1, we see he, he's clearly aware of what's going on. He's in charge. He's walking amongst these things. He's holding the pastors in his hands. Uh, and he's about to give us some more direction about the good. And, and then as I was thinking about this, we... We kind of get have different pictures of church hierarchy, like like who's in what position, why they're there, uh, and so we're actually going to have a new members class after the service today. So if you haven't gotten to be a part of that, I'd encourage you to. But we'll talk about some of those things, church leadership. Uh, and um, I went back to a place of DBS. It was kind of a crazy week. If you guys were there, so there was a lot of bad weather, and we were at the park, and then we came back over here the next week. And yeah, at times I was just going like, God, what is going on? Um, and then God did some amazing things, didn't he, right? We were able to use this space. I just saw, you know, kids with a giant parachute thing. And I was like, this is amazing. So inside the building. But as kids were leaving, I uh, was standing at the door, and a parent uh, came up and uh, and asked me, are you the pastor? Sometimes they're not sure, right? They're like, are you a youth guy? Are you one of the students? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and because I've gotten that before. And uh, so are you the pastor? I said, yeah. And um, uh, Peter, who is with the uh the uh, Zuber family, and uh, he, he was standing by the door, and I didn't know he was behind me, so he kind of startled me. So this guy asked me, are you the pastor? I said, yes. And Peter goes, that's right, in a really loud voice. <laughs> he stayed behind me. He goes, and he's the boss of this church. <laughs> Peter, buddy. I said, God's the boss of this church. I said, I'm, I'm just glad to be the pastor church and to, and to hopefully in the place that I hope I am like we talked about we sang about that there is this place where I hope I'm at most of the time I mean, on, on my knees seeking direction from God um, and that I'd be fortunate enough for um, Jesus to be holding and giving me direction that's the place I want to be so uh, so thank you Peter for that and 
Uh, just a reminder, right? A reminder of where we need to need to be. And so as Jesus is talking to the church, uh, he wants us to remember who he is. I love what A.W. Tozer said in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so when we read this, do we, do we really see it and we go, man, God, he's a serious dude. He's very powerful. He's He's holding the pastors in his hand. He's really holding the whole world in his hand, right? We sing about that. He's walking amongst the lampstands. He's not just uh, like he, he's not just over here going, okay, churches, yeah, I've been do your thing. Like I'll be back in a while and check up on you. No, he's walking amongst the churches. So he's very involved in what's going on. And so the question is, do we picture Jesus like this little guy who's you know in our pocket? And then when things are difficult, like we go to him and say, We need some help. If you could, you know, if you could come out and help us. And that would be excellent right now. But then when things are good again, we're going to put you away, okay? Sometimes you make us feel uncomfortable. And so, no, Jesus, he's very much, whether or not we like it, he's in the midst of what's going on. He wants to give us direction. He wants us to hear it. And so that's verse 1. Verse 2 kind of helps us understand what, why do we do good, right? So we come to church. Uh, we, you know, we participate in other things. And like small groups, we're starting up those again. So that's been awesome with the youth and the kids. Uh, tonight, uh, our one of our adult groups, so if you have uh, kids who are teenagers, is going to meet tonight here at the church, and so I encourage you to be a part of that. There's a group for everybody, and so um, in the same way, we're going to see, here's what it says, why we continue to do good. Why do we do good? Here's what it says. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. So Jesus is not unaware of who we are and what we're doing. He wants to encourage us. He says, I know your works. In the Greek, the ergon, meaning deeds, acts, or what you have been putting your effort into. So, so where are we putting our effort? Like, where are we putting our focus? Like, uh, and it's easy for us to say, well, I come to church on Sunday, so I put my effort there. But what else are we doing? Are we committed to daily devotion to God? Are we, are we putting any other effort forward? Are we, are we like looking forward to being a part of the community? Are we keeping involved with people throughout the week? Are like we reading the prayer list and like actually taking a moment to go, oh man, I need to pray for them because they are my brother and sister, a family of faith. So we do this together. So we need to be reminded that our works, and so Matthew 5, 16 says this, uses the same word here for works. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God, your Father who is in heaven. And so why do we do these things? How do we keep doing them? Well, uh, we do them for God because we love him. We do these in community. Uh, and then we also do them so that the rest of the world just like should look in at us and go, there is something really different about them. It's strange. It's cool. I think I may like it. And so, so we want people to be able to look in at us and go, there's something there that I don't have. And I want that, right? So where in the world can you come to a place where people of all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic statuses, all different places, all different kinds of work, and somehow we're all in this place, and we're all unified in this one purpose to follow God faithfully, right? So how do we do that? Well, Jesus tells us here, he says, I know your works, right? It's not like you have to pretend to be something else. Your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles. Now, this was another issue for the church, as, as well as people who are just like, yeah, we don't worship God, like we don't want anything to do with him. Uh, there are people who are going, yeah, we're Christians, but, you know, the gospel, I mean, Jesus, like, yeah, maybe he was a real dude, and maybe he came, he did some stuff, but he's not really God. And so there are people who would throw things in there and say, yeah, we're believers, but, yeah, we don't believe part of this stuff, right? And so you can't do that, right? You can't take what you want out of it. And so, and Jesus is saying, hey, this is good. I want you to keep doing this, all right? So continue to do that. And that's in verse 2. And in verse 3, it tells us how we continue to do good, right? So how do we focus on this? How do we go, what is the good? Uh, I want to continue to be able to do that. And verse 3 says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Wow, that's a good word, right? And especially in it's, the last couple of years have been tough, right? Even now, like new things come out, and it seems like everybody has been taking a side for like the last couple of years. And, and one person's over here, and one person's over here. You could be a part of the same family. Uh, you could be a part of the same family of faith. And, and if you don't do what the other person does, then they're bad, and they're evil, and they're wrong, right? And that's what the world's telling us right now. Instead of going, what should we be doing? Well, how do we continue to do the good? He says, I know you are enduring patiently. Oh, man, that's a word that we need, right? We need to be enduring patiently what's going on. 
And some of this, I think, we're on the side of, oh, you're not doing the right thing. So you're bad, or you're wrong. And what is God asking us to do? To endure patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, you have not grown weary. Right? Well, that's tough, right? And there's been times, right, especially in this season, we just feel like weary and we're like, how do we keep going on? Well, he uses this word for patience or patiently in the Greek, the word hupomeno, meaning to be steadfast or constant. Um, it's used in James chapter 1 a couple of times in verses 3 and 4. It says this, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And a steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And let the steadfastness have its full effect. So how does this take place? Well, it doesn't just happen like that, right? So but sometimes we're just like, God, I'd like to test, but I'd like it to be sure, you know? I'd like it to be like multiple choice, or maybe even true false. Those are really good. Like, I like those kind of tests because it's 50-50. Like, you study, right? Man, I'm, I mean, I got a good shot, right? So I'm going to get it. I like those kind of tests. Not fill in the blank. Like, not like the paragraph or like short answer because I never did well in those, right? I know some of you understand that. So this test, more often than not, is a test that takes place over an extended period of time. It involves grief. It involves heartache. It involves difficulty. And as we walk through the midst of that, Jesus, he wants to encourage us, right? He says, like the church in Ephesus, I know you are enduring patiently. Be steadfast in the steadfastness in order for it to have its full effect. It should be perfect and complete and lacking nothing, right? And maybe some of the times, too, we go through that test and we're like, man, I'm feeling better. Like, God's encouraged me and I've walked through that and I, and I still love him and I want to follow him. And we're like, all right, so I'm good. And the next test comes. And the next one, right? So it's never ending until we are standing before God in heaven. And that's what James was talking about. He says that you may be perfect. When are we perfect and complete and lacking nothing? Standing before God, right? So the test is not over. I know a lot of us would be like, well, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of hoping the last test was the last one. Like I graduated, I'm done with school, don't have to do that anymore. Well, you know, how do we continue to keep doing this good? We've got to keep a right perspective, right? We have to know that this testing, this difficulty, it's not going to stop until we're standing before God. God, okay? And so that's the good. And the second fill in the blank is the bad, right? So we got the good, we got the bad. And each of the churches that we look at, they're going to have some semblance of this. Here's some things you're doing well. Um, here's some things you need to work on. And then here's this end result. You know, you need to change something, do something a little differently, and continue to be faithful, right? So here's the bad. And in verse 4, um, we see how to understand and see the bad, right? So Because sometimes we're blinded, right? And we're doing things that are sinful or wrong or just... Um, uh, maybe we're just unaware of, right? And that happens. And we need people to come alongside us and help us. And so in verse 4, it says this, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Oh, man. You hear those words, and when I, when I read them for the first time, and Jesus is saying, But I have this against you. Oh, I mean, that should hit us like a ton of bricks. What does the Lord have against us? I, I want to know what that is, right? Uh, when uh, I know if you look throughout the life of David, we've been looking through that in 2 Samuel. He, he made a lot of mistakes, right? And sometimes there was somebody else who had to come alongside him. You remember reading about the prophet Nathan who said, hey, man, this was bad. You took the one guy's sheep. You're the man, right? So we have to be reminded of those things, sometimes by other people. But David throughout his life, too, would go, God, if there's anything that doesn't honor you, would you take that far, far away from me? And so that was most of David's life, but he even still had to have a brother a prophet Nathan come and go, man, what did you do? And we need people around us. We need the family of faith for that purpose, to be able to help us. And Jesus says this, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So this has never happened in relationships, too. Uh, maybe you guys in, in marriage, right, as you kind of go throughout and years go, go by, and you go, how do we renew this? How do we um, restore this? How do we encourage it? Because there's seasons of difficulty, right? There's times where you just go, do we still have the same feelings that we did at the very beginning? And you have to go, let's remember why we love each other. Let's remember how, why God has put us together and to celebrate that. In the same way, uh, Jesus talking to the church, he says that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So how do we get back to this? And this isn't just like somebody coming up to you on the street, somebody you don't know and going, hey, you're, you're bad. Like, you're not good at this. Like, I don't like you. It's easy for us to, for somebody we don't know, who know doesn't know us, right, to just go, you're crazy. I don't have to listen to you, right? Uh, and sometimes we'd like to have that perspective of people who really know us, too. Because when somebody really knows us, who really loves God, 
maybe mentoring us, comes to us and says, hey, I think there's this sin that you might need to work on, that you might need to think about. Then we go, oh, I guess I have to listen, right? So when Jesus says it, we need to listen. He says that they've left, they've left this love that they had at first. Now the word here for having abandoned, in the Greek it's the word FMA, meaning to neglect, depart, or disregard. It's found here in 1 John 1, 9. It's actually translated differently in the English. It's translated as forgiven. So 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, you may know it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what is he? He's faithful and just to abandon us from all of our sins. All the, all the penalty, all the consequences of that. In the same way, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, Hey, you've abandoned this love you had at first. By the way, I haven't abandoned you. If you put your faith and trust in, in me, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, I've not abandoned you. I've taken care of you. In fact, what I have done is I've abandoned your sin and the consequences of it. So at times, we go, man, we stumble, we make mistakes, and we, we kind of take a sidestep. And Jesus he uses the same word here, I think, for a reason, because we read this in 1 John, we go, he's forgiven. What has he done? He's, he's abandoned all these consequences of sin for us. While at times, we go, yeah, I just I forgot why I loved you in the first place. We have to go back to that place. Say, God, if that's us, that's us, how do we get back to that? In verse 5, he's going to tell us. He help us understand how we get back to the good, right? We got the good, we got the bad. He says in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you, remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So we heard Rachel share with us about her story, kind of coming to a, a difficult place where she was just at rock bottom, and she had to go, there's some things that are not right. Or there's some things that I'm doing or focusing on that don't honor the Lord. And what did she say? I had to repent of those things. So it wasn't that after coming to know Jesus, she, she was like, I don't even know if I'm saved anymore, right? That's not what she said. She realized she came to this place where she had just been focusing on the world and everything else in it. She didn't go on completely lost. She went, I just need to turn full circle and head back towards God. Because he's always there, right? He's not abandoned us, but at times we abandon him. And we say, does he really love us? Does he really care about us? Why did I love him in the first place? Well, verse 5 says, remember where you've fallen from, right? Sometimes it's hard. We're like, I can't see the, through the fog. There's been so much that's gone on since then. How do I even get back to that place? And the clear word here is this word of, Repentance. And Rachel mentioned it a couple of times. And I don't want you to forget that because there's no place that you could go that could be so far away from God that you could never get back to him. Okay? And if you put your faith and trust in him, but like what Jesus is saying, he said, You just left your first love. You're doing a lot of things really, really well. You did a lot of things that are really, really great. But you've left the first love. So repent and turn back and seek after me like you did at first. Do you maybe remember when you met the person that you're with now, your significant other? And at the very beginning, you were like, always spending time together, right? always holding hands, always looking at each other in the eye, you know? Always saying, I love you so much, right? Yeah, what? You guys aren't doing that? <laughs> I remember that. I still try to do it. And so hey, maybe uh, maybe sometimes we, we think about that, and we just need to go, man, I need to get back to that place. It's one of the reasons I love having David and Rachel on, right? We have just seasons, people who are in different seasons, and we go, hey, remember how that was, right? It's not that you stop loving each other, you forget those things, but you go, man, that's a sweet season of life, isn't it? And we think back to our relationship with God in the same way, we're like, man, we first put our faith and trust in Jesus, it was like so amazing, and God's saying, it doesn't have to stop, right? You can go right back to him. You can repent. And all those things that maybe you've just been sitting on your life, just kind of surface level, and you're just let, let, letting them bog you down. Jesus says, repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And these lampstands, they were representative of the churches, right? So there's a lot of churches around here, a lot of small churches. And what I see a lot of churches closing down which is being bought by businesses, by homes, by whoever, being demolished. And that's really sad, isn't it? And I believe a lot of these churches, this is the place they went to. They forgot their first love of God. Why, did, why were they doing what they were doing to begin with? Why did they come to a place to worship? 
And they just kept coming to that place and just going, like, at, at some point, why are we here anymore? And people left the church, and the church closed down. And I really want us to examine this because there's a consequence for it, right? He says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I think there's a lot of churches, too, that are still meeting as a group of people, but I'm not sure they have the lampstand there anymore. I'm not sure they're a beacon of hope or light for the community. And Jesus is going, it's because you didn't listen to me to begin with when I said, go back to where you were. Go back to that first love. So luckily, Jesus doesn't leave it there. Last fill in the blank is the conquerors. The conquerors. And so we're going to see this word uh, many times throughout the book of Revelation. There's going to be the good stuff the church is doing. There's going to be the bad stuff they're doing. Like, hey, you need to you need to work on this a little bit, right? If you want to keep the lamp stand, if you want to keep the church and its influence, which is, by the way, being held together by God, uh, he, he's going he's gonna to give us some encouragement and say, hey, here's what the conquerors are going to do, right? Here are these people who are going to stand before God, and he's going to go, hey, good job, everybody. Let's celebrate for eternity, right? And so here's what he says. He's going to leave it with hope pretty much every time he talks to one of the churches. Uh, in verse 6, it says, that yet this you have... You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And so what do we need to be about? We need to be these conquerors through same thought, right? So we go back to this first love, and as we're on our knees, and as we're looking at the word, as we're surrounding ourselves by other believers, and trying to walk faithfully together, uh, being held accountable by them, or we come to this place of, we need to be of the same thought. So Jesus reminds them, here's the good stuff, here's the bad stuff, and then here's how we walk. Here's how you walk as conquerors. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And so it's it's a good thing to go, and we are, here are things we're doing well. We're following Jesus, like we're, we're in the Word, we want to be of the same thought, and we want to go back to that love that we had at first. We want to be aligned with God's thought, right? Because there's a lot of crazy things going on right now. There's a lot of different <coughs> ideologies, uh, ideologies even in the church that depart from the Bible. I think that's crazy. Like we have like this really specific guidebook. And people will just at times go, yeah, you know what? This stuff's really good, but you know, there's this part I don't like. So we're just not going to read that part, okay? Uh, so uh, you know that's not what we do here, right? We want to have the full counsel of God's Word. We want to read through it. It's one of the reasons that we go through books of the Bible. We do book studies. Uh, we do topical things, but then we also kind of stick to these larger sections of text that, if I'm being honest, at times, there's places where I go, oh, I don't know that I want to talk about that because that's hard, right? What does the word of God do? When we go back to this place of this first love, uh, Jesus reminds us that if we're doing this, we're going to be on the same thought, right? So uh, Jesus is saying to the church, hey, you've got some good things going on. Let me give you some encouragement um, as we exit this word to you. You have this. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus says, I also hate those, right? The things that they're doing. Who are the Nicolaitans? Well, they were this group of people uh, that, that kind of was, they subdivided when Christianity started. They said, we're going to follow you know, the teachings of Jesus, all that stuff's good, but we're just not sure we're going to you know, do everything else, right? We kind of think like, I mean, you know, singing, praising God, or, you know, believing he can do miraculous things, like, that's weird. And, um, you know, we don't know that we can believe in some of that stuff. So if you want to, you know, want to be a Christian, you can be in our group, Nicolaitans. So we're going to just kind of do what we think feels right at the time, or what we feel better about. And Jesus is going, man, I'm glad you guys aren't like them. I'm glad you guys are staying true to the word. You have the same thoughts. We can be these conquerors through the same thought. And the last verse, we're conquerors through our identity, right? Because at times we we get bogged down, right, by the world. We, we make our own mistakes. We fall away from that first love, like Jesus said. And then here he gives us a word of encouragement. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So when things are going difficult, when things are tough, like do we look back to this picture like we, we looked at last week, this vision of who Jesus is. He's got these, uh, these royal garments on. He's got this gold sash. Um, he, he's in heaven as we're looking at him, you know, at the throne. I mean, what did John do? He like, he falls down and he, he's like, what do I even do, right? He's overwhelmed by who Jesus is. And this is, should be the place that we are that we know we will be with God in heaven, right? That we have this confidence. So as conquerors, we're not walking around the world like in every you know little difficulty having fear, right? Because at times that can really push us away from God and, and we'll go, well, I, God, do I really believe 
fallen, fallen to the wayside so far, like the Nicolaitans. That's why Jesus said, hey, uh, I'm glad you guys don't like what they're doing, because I don't like it either, because it's not really Christianity. And he reassures them, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, there's this guy named Andrew of Caesarea, he's a church father. He said, every person has a physical ear, right? Everybody has physical ears. And then he said, but the only, but only the spiritual person has spiritual ears. So you can walk around in the world today, you can hear the things that are going on, the road noise, the people talking at your work, um, as you go about your day, and you hear a lot of things physically, right? But the question is, what Jesus poses to us, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as Jesus is directly speaking to us, there's a question of, are we going to listen? Are we going to hear? Well, if we have Jesus in our lives, if we put our faith and trust in him initially, and he's just saying, just come back. If you would just come back to this place where you had this first love, remember how great that was. If you would just come back, and if you would have the same thought, and remember, remember, because there's going to be those testings, right? There's going to be those times we have to go, are we going to be steadfast? And we can if we remain in the same thought, and then our identity belongs to God. Like when we hear these things, we should be encouraged, and we should go, man, that, that's such a good word to hear. And then we leave this place, and sometimes we get discouraged, but what does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to keep coming back to this place where we go, we are conquerors. We belong to God because he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in paradise of God. Can you imagine being in that place with God? I mean, throughout, all throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus is going to remind us what it's going to look like. He's given this picture to John so that we can have hope that as we walk through these difficult seasons, as we try to be steadfast and we go back to that first love, it's not that we don't acknowledge what reality is, right? We see the good things the church does, right? But we should also acknowledge we need to work on things. We need to increase. We need to do better. Because we can have confidence at the end of the day. I mean, when the enemy whispers in our ear, because he does every single week, right? We like to pretend like he's not there. We just had this series on spiritual warfare, so we were probably more uncomfortably aware uh, of Satan's presence and evil forces. And so we have to be in this place where we go, we know it's going to come, right? Satan's going to come. He's going to whisper in our ear. He's going to say, you're worthless. You're not, you're not good for anything. What does God want to do with you? And then we remember what Jesus said to the church as he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So maybe it's just a matter of remembering, right? Of thinking back to that first love that we had, how amazing it is and how we can get back to that place. We talked about that repentance. So whatever's going on in our life, maybe God's even, he's like convicting us, uh, 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 you know, right now, and he's done that in the past, but it's just easy to, no, no, I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to deal with that. But then he brings it back to you, says, if you want to be in that right place, if you want to have this perfect fellowship with me, this is who you are. This is where our identity comes from. To the one who conquers. Where will we be? We're going to be in paradise, right? Isn't that good news? I mean, no matter what we go through right now, all the difficulty, the steadfastness that will come, that will last throughout our entire lives having to walk through the test, not just a simple, easy one that you might take in school one day. We just need to remember, don't we? Well, I have some favorite clips that I like to use, and I'm going to show you one uh, before we close. So go ahead and turn your attention to the screen. Sure do. You move faster, boy. Bye. Hey, wait. You know my father? Correction. I know your father. I hate to tell you this, but he died a long time ago. No, throw him again. <laughs> He's alive. And I show him to you. You follow old Rafiki, he knows the way. Come on. Don't go up. Hurry up. Oh, wait, wait. Come on. Come on. Just slow down.
that's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see, he lives in you. Sure, I remember, you know, most of us growing up watching those kind of movies, the Disney movies, the animated ones, and there are things I think we forget, pictures that uh, point us towards who God is, and I remember when I, I was thinking about that, and seeing somebody, he's looking down in the water, he's going, Dad's right there, right? He lives inside of you, and, uh, and what a great picture, because sometimes we forget, right? We get bogged down in life, and Jesus goes, I think you've forgotten your first love. And so come back. Uh, repent. So I'm glad um, we've been able to have this time and, and just ask that serious question. I think we all have to ask it and go, is there something that's keeping me from having that kind of relationship that I had at first? And whatever that is, uh, probably different for every single one of us. Uh, but we need to go back to that place and go, God, how do we worship you wholeheartedly? And how do we have that love that we had for you? At first, because there's the good, there's the bad, and then we need to be reminded if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, then we are conquerors. Uh, we can walk with Him faithfully, keeping the perspective of eternity uh, in our minds. So, like that, you see, I kind of I love that too, because it's like a picture of Jesus when He comes back. He's on the clouds, right? He's cracking open the sky. Uh, and as we think about that, it should encourage us, right? But we've got hope. We don't have to just sit in our sadness and our depression and our in our state of hopelessness, right? Because it's not us; it's the rest of the world. We have hope. We have this first love that we can go back to. Um, so I encourage as we look through the rest of these churches in the book of Revelation, I know it's going to be a lot of fun together to think about these things uh, and to be encouraged in it together. Uh, but maybe if you've been listening to this and uh, you're, you're listening online, you're here in person, you've never made that decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus, uh, we know it's as easy as this to admit that you're a sinner. And maybe you're like, I've never had that first love with God. Uh, well, admit your sinner. Believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he came and he lived a sinless life, and he died on the cross, and he was raised from the dead so that each one of you could have eternal life if you choose to trust in him. Scripture tells us we can confess with our mouths that he is Lord, and then we will be saved. So maybe you just need to take that step today. If you're online, you can reach out to us. If you're in person, I'll be here afterwards to talk with you. Uh, let me pray with you, and we'll close. Father, we thank you uh, for this day. Um, God, we pray that as we uh, look to uh, Revelation, as we look towards this amazing picture of who you are and, and how you remind us of what you're going to do when you come back, and all these things that you showed John, this amazing picture of who you actually are right now. Um, God, let us not be satisfied with just this, um, this version of you that's not really who you are. God, I pray that we would see the things that, that we do well, God. You know, you acknowledge that for the church in Ephesus. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's what we do. Here's what we do well, God. But there are things that don't honor you. God, I pray that um, through your own uh, convicting of us, uh, that we would seek you in repentance. Each of us individually, each of us personally, that we might go back to that place. And maybe we just need to be reminded. Maybe there's somebody else in our lives that needs to remind us um, of the hope that we have because, God, you you didn't want to leave the, cur the church unencouraged. You wanted to encourage them. And so you, you left them with that peace that there are those who are conquerors, those who hear by the Spirit, what you say to the churches. I pray that we would hear that, apply it to our lives, and that we would think about this paradise, this hope that we have that 
that give us this ability to think rightly in this life, um, to have hope, not that there won't be difficulty, difficult seasons, testing, but we will have to remain steadfast. Lord, how do we do this, God? We know that we do it through you, through this love that we have for you at first. Uh, if there's anybody here, God, who doesn't know you, anybody listening, I pray that this would be a day that they make that decision to trust in you for the first time. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I love you, church. Have a good Sunday. Um, just as a reminder, um, as you're visiting, that's fine. Uh, we'll be uh, moving downstairs for the new member class.